All right, uh, hello everyone, thanks for coming along to this week's seminar. So this week, Peter's gonna be giving a talk on his PhD research in high quality real-time global illumination augmented reality, so. Big hand for Peter. Hello everyone, and thank you for coming. Um, I would like to present you something about my PhD thesis, which I do in Technical University in Vienna, Austria. And I would like to present you also something about my research group, what we do there and some projects and also something about the work which I do here. Um, so last week, uh, Timo started a nice tradition that he bring a cake, and uh, <laughs> he inspired me because this is a good way how to keep you motivated. So I did the same, it's here. Uh, I probably wouldn't be able to do this alone, but a nice thing happened to me. I married with a nice girl from Slovakia. <laughs> so she's here, Katrin. So if you like the cake, then you can address her. <laughs> So the topic of my PhD thesis is high quality real-time global illumination for augmented reality. And what I do he there is I try to make a virtual objects for augmented reality more visually coherent with the real object and to look more realistic because this can be useful for many uh, real-time augmented reality applications. Firstly, I would like to start with a short description of myself. So I come from Slovakia. That's the little country in the middle of Europe here. And it has uh, many similarities with New Zealand. It has around 5 million inhabitants. And we have also a lot of sheep there. It's very traditional to uh, farm the sheep. We have also nice mountains there. And we have many traditions, like in clothes and dancing and all the others. And if I zoom in, it looks like this. And where do I live is here in Bratislava. That's the capital city of Slovakia. It's a small city. And the closest capital of the next country is Vienna. So that's where I study. That means that I have to travel every day 70 kilometers there and back. What's a good opportunity for me to read a lot of papers in the train. Now I'd like to start to present something about our research group and what we do in Vienna. So we have a small research group consisting around uh, 11 people. And the head of our research group is Professor Hannes Kaufmann. That's this one. And what we do is we concentrate on the research and development in the areas of tracking and motion capture and in augmented reality, mobile applications, 3D reconstruction and interactions, and all the other stuff. I think many similar works are done also here in HitLab. So if somebody would be interested about collaboration, we would be happy to communicate about that. Now I would like to present some projects which we did and which we do uh, in VR group. One of them is Project Playmaster, which uh, is concentrated to create a serious games framework for uh, serious purposes like rehabilitation and medical treatment. And in this uh, project, the motion capture suite was developed and it was used to uh, insert a patient into the, augment into the virtual reality scenario and to help him with the treatment with movement or uh, the other uh, parts. I can show you a short video about this. So the suite looks like this. It has a lot of uh, reflective refer markers on that. And uh, the similar tracking system is used as you have here, the D-Track, but this was developed uh, by uh, our group. And it's tracking the human body, it's tracking motion. And then we can reconstruct the skeleton of the patient. And this can be used to insert person into the virtual reality. And then applications like this can be created where a person is climbing and if we want him to train his hand or other parts of his body. Yeah, also a walking platform can be used if we need him to walk. And other parts of his body can be moved. So here you see, for example, how he can run uh, or use other parts of his body in the virtual reality. So now he is walking on the walking platform in the reality, and he can control the virtual character. This can be used for training for patients with emotion problems <clears throat> and for rehabilitation. Another project which was done in our department was uh, supporting projects for firefighters, uh, where the equipment for firefighters was developed and uh, special novel technologies were used there. One of them was Kinect, and another was a thermal camera, and the approach for 3D reconstruction of the surrounding environment was used 
to provide uh, additional information for firefighters and to be able to send these informations into the control center and then process the information and make some important decisions what to do and where to perform the rescue operations. I can also show you a short video about this. So here you see the equipment. Here is the helmet with the Kinect, and uh, and this is the thermal camera. And there are then there are some transferring devices. And this is the reconstructed environment seen by the Kinect. A Kinect fusion approach is used here to reconstruct the 3D surrounding environment. Here you see the video of the person in the space, and as he look around, uh, the environment is progressively re reconstructed. He can also walk in the dark and see properly the surrounding environment. For now, he should uh, only move very slowly because this is the first prototype. But maybe in the future improvement, it can be really useful for some operations. And then uh, in the con control center, in the command center, they can see the reconstructed model of the environment. They can observe it and pre uh, pro give him some proper instructions what to do. This is the overlay image of the thermal camera. So you can see thermal response in the middle. This can be useful for detecting the source of fire or for some human bodies lying on the ground. <clears throat> you can see here uh, that he can move pretty in the dark and he still sees the environment around him. And as he looks more up, then there is a character uh, who is taking a video of him. And then you see in thermal response that you, you have a high response in the character place. I can maybe move it a bit further. Here is the room uh, where is a human lying on the ground here. And you see that the 3D data are overlaid by the color from the temperature of the body, so it's more reddish there. And then what we can do is we can texture map all the environment by the color data, and we can observe this uh, in the command center, like, and it can look like this. So we can observe it and see the human lying here. And also we can see some sources of fire and the other important thermal data. Uh, and other th things which we do are medical applications. One which uh, was done uh, was, for example, virtual reality applications for training for patients with the upper limb prosthesis. And the system which takes patients into the virtual reality was uh, developed, uh, which is using a special myosensors, which can detect the muscle activity. And then uh, we, can, uh, we can let patients to learn how to properly use the grasping power of their prosthesis in the future and how to properly control it to uh, grasp the objects in the proper power and in the proper spatial location. I can also show you a short video of this. <clears throat> so here is again equipment. That's just a head-mounted display which is tracked by the optical tracking system. This is a myosensors which detect the muscles activity and the target for the hand tracking. Here we can see how it looks. And here you can see already a 3D environment where he is controlling the virtual hand. And there is the yellow uh, spot circle. And he should uh, target the virtual spheres, which are in the space. And then he should try to grasp them by the hand. And he can use the, these muscles for that to control the power of the, of the grasping. And he should use a proper grasping power to catch the objects. And then he, sh he can just release them anywhere. So this is. The simple task which will 
let him learn how to properly use the processes to spatially orientate and also to use the proper grasping power to grasp the objects. Here, here we can see the output from, from my sensors. It's here. I don't know if something is visible there, but there are some curves. If he grasps his hand, then uh, he gets a higher response. And as soon as he uses uh, too much grasping power, then uh, the circle indicates it, and also the ball, ball disappears or spread around. And by using this, he can learn how to use proper grasping power in, the, in his future prothesis. We are also interested about the tracking technologies. So there were two tracking systems uh, developed in our department based on the infrared optical tracking. One of them is IO tracker system, which is based exactly on the same technology as your D-Track system here in the lab. It uses uh, these refractive uh, ball markers in uh, predefined constellations, and then it, it can detect the six, six uh, degrees of freedom tracking and, uh, but the difference from the D-Track is that this should be more affordable and cheapest solution. And the second tracking solution which was developed is the track infrared tracking for the tunnel measurement systems. Uh, because in the tunnels there is usually lack of the GPS signal or the other signals. So the infrared optical tracking was developed which is kind of precise also for the large scale environments like in the tunnels. Another project which we did uh, are one, for example, for virtual reality for infinite moving uh, into the virtual reality, which is called flexible spaces, and also other uh, projects for the mobile tracking for large scale environments and the others. We are also a bit interested about the robotics, as you are here. Uh, so what was developed was, for example, this quadcopter robot, which can fly in the space, and we are trying to uh, create some autonomous flying algorithms and autonomic autonomous localization algorithms. Now I would like to speak about, a bit about uh, my thesis. So the topic is high quality global illumination for augmented reality. And uh, when we ask uh, what is important for rendering the real objects, uh, the virtual objects in real videos looks more real, then we need to think about more conditions from which the importance are the proper rendering algorithm and compositing, which means inserting the objects into the video then proper lighting simulation and detection of the real light, which will be then used for the lighting of the uh, virtual object. Then proper material simulation uh, to properly simulate the light interreflections between the virtual and real objects. And finally, proper camera model to fit the camera properties of the real camera and camera properties of the virtual camera. So in our work, uh, to be able to properly simulate rendering and light, uh, light uh, interreflections, we use the ray tracing algorithm. And to composite the virtual objects into the real videos, we use a differential rendering algorithm, which I'll describe later. And uh, our algorithm is running in one pass, what is the improvement over previous work. And in order to estimate the lighting in, of the real environment, we use a special light source estimation procedure which I will also describe later. And we can simulate special material properties like refraction, reflection, or caustics. And, and recently, we added a special approach for diffuse global illumination calculation in augmented reality. And in camera, we can simulate the physically correct depth of field effect, which is the effect where you have uh, objects which are in focus are sharp, and objects which are out of focus are blurred. So if you simulate this for the virtual objects too, we get a much more coherent image. And then also anti-lasting is very important for augmented reality to get a much more smoother image. So as I mentioned, we use a one pass differential rendering algorithm to composite virtual objects with the real ones. This is running on the GPU. And we use this equation for it. Many of you probably know it already. So these are the terms from the equations. And what do we need to be, uh, to be able to calculate the final solution? This is the final solution where we insert this virtual teapot into the real scene consisting of real paper, cube, and table. Uh, then we need to calculate two solutions of global illumination. And 
this is the one solution, and this is the second solution. Oh, thanks. So this is called mixed solution, which contains both uh, real and virtual objects, and it calculates light transport between them. And this is the second solution, which calculates the illumination of the real scene only. So here you see that only real paper cube is rendered. And then we can get the final image by using the pixels of the virtual object in place of the virtual object. This is defined by the mask. So where the mask is one, uh, it's this term. Then we use only pixels from this image. And we have this virtual object here. And everywhere else, this is this term. Then we use the camera image. This is IC. This is the image captured by the real camera. And we add to this the difference between the mixed uh, solution and the real solution of the global illumination. These are those two. And the difference between them represent exactly the light change uh, which happens by adding the virtual objects to the scene. So for example, this shadow is added here. And we can see it here in the final solution. And also we can see that this uh, side of the cube is a bit more reddish, which is caused by the color bleeding from this uh, from this teapot to the real paper cube. <clears throat> then to estimate light sources in the real environment, we use a special camera with fisheye lens, which looks exactly like this. And the lens, lens have a nice property that it has a field of view of 180 degrees, so it can capture the whole hemisphere uh, of the light incoming to the certain point. And then we can use this to estimate the light sources in the environment. And we use the image processing approach to do that. So firstly, we apply thresholding to the image and to get the big bright areas from, of the light sources. And then we process those by the connected component analysis. And we find the big blobs of the lights. We detect this, and we sample them. And then we have finally the light source positions. So the input image from the camera looks like this, which is capturing the whole room. I mean the upper part, and then we apply thresholding on top of it. Then the bright areas like this and this remain. So it looks like this. And then we can detect by connected component analysis this and these bright areas, maybe also this, but this is not that connected. And we can sample them, for example, by, this is one sample, or we can sample them by more samples uh, as light sources. Then we should simulate proper material properties of the virtual objects. So what we can do now by ray tracing is to simulate the physically correct reflection and refraction. And also we can correctly reproject. We can correctly display the real environment refracted in the virtual objects, as we can see here. So this is the virtual glass. And we can see that the real environment, the, the hand is refracted properly in that. And for this, we use a reprojection technique, which is described here on this image. And it works uh, like this. Here is the center of projection of the camera, here is the image plane. And if we want to calculate the color of this pixel, we should ray through it uh, by the standard ray tracing procedure. Then we hit the virtual object. Uh, we bend the ray because it's refractive. Then we find another boundary. We, hit, uh, we bend the ray again. And then we find the diffuse real object, which is the table or something else. And to be able to provide this color back, and use it in this pixel, we need to reproject this point back to the image plane. So we reproject it here to the point R. And then we can read uh, the information from the position uh, of the, uh, in the image captured by camera. And we read exactly in this position. And we get the right color, which should be used and uh, returned back through this ray tracing pipeline and used in this image. This allows us to use this kind of uh, correct uh, refraction. And then we can also calculate caustics, which are light patterns like this one below the virtual glass monkey. And we calculate them by using photon mapping in augmented reality. Yes. In all the cases, uh, we assume that we already have some predefined model of the real environment. Uh, we can later connect it with some automatic reconstruction uh, methods, for example, Kinect Fusion or the others. But we, what we concentrate on in this work is more rendering. So we assume that we already have this model. The case with the hand, uh, yeah. I'm not saying anything. I'm not using the 3D model of the hand, but how are you calculating that? 
Now, the thing is that we, we don't use the 3D model. So we, in this case, we have a predefined model of the real environment as it is just a table. And then as soon as we put the hand there, the ray from the glass is going like through the hand and uh, hitting here, the surface. But there is a texture uh, which comes from camera and this texture is used. So it looks still uh, believ believable. So there is no 3D model of the hand behind it, but it's like the table texture is reprojected back. In this case, we use just one, but we can use also more. We can use also area light sources or other like kind of light sources. What would be better to use something like image-based lighting approach to use the whole environment map as a source of light? But this could be uh, calculational. Uh, this can be expensive from calculational point of view. So we need somehow to sample it. That's why we detect the light sources in the map. So we implemented this system uh, using ray tracing engine from NVIDIA called Optics. This is running on NVIDIA hardware and it's built on top of CUDA. So uh, our algorithms run on the GPU. Then our camera model we implemented in, in ray generation program also running on the GPU. Then photo mapping for caustics. This is implemented as a combination of GPU and CPU. And we use a stratified jitter sampling for sampling pixels area and aperture area to get a nicely blurred image in case of depth of field. And uh, for this, we use a predefined uh, num uh, array of num random numbers, which is generated on the CPU. And this is then sent to the GPU. And if we use always the same array of random number, this helps us to overcome the problems with temporal coherence. And we don't have a temporal noise then in the image. And for tracking, we use the ar 2 plus library but this can be any time exchange for any other tracking solution. So now I'd like to show you some results. Uh, here you can see the comparison of rendering without depth of field, that's this side, and with depth of field using our method and uh, our camera model in ray tracing. So here you can see the real paper cubes on the left side and the virtual cubes on the right side. And you can see when the camera is defocused and we render the virtual objects just with normal a camera, then they are unnaturally sharp and they are not visually coherent. And as soon as we use a physically correct camera model with aperture, with finite size aperture, then we are able to render a virtual object like this, which are much, much more coherent. Here we can see the same with the image focused on the first cube. So these uh, cubes which are behind are also incoherent here and more coherent here. Maybe now I can show you a video. Um, how do you measure um, yeah, that's a good question. What we do now is we can anytime change the parameters uh, of the camera in our ray tracing system. Parameters are like focus distance, aperture size, and some others. But what we do now, we don't have this uh, data uh, from camera, so we just set uh, focus of the real camera to the uh, fixed distance, and we do the same in the ray tracing system. And then we can move the camera and it works, but as soon as we change the focus of real camera, we should change also the focus of virtual camera. So I can show you a short video. <coughs> uh, which describes our system, how it works. So what we can do is this physically based refraction. Here is again this virtual glass. And you see if we are moving around, all the real objects are refracted in the virtual glass. Yeah, this is, this is uh, like the on the fly capture from the system. So here you see if I'm moving the hand behind, it's correctly refracted in there. Then we can get physically correct reflection here in the ring. And here we see that very important this anti-aliasing. So here we see in aliased image, there is a big noise on the edges. And here it's very nicely smooth image, what is very good for the visual coherence. And we simulate caustics. This is this heart-shaped light pattern inside the ring. And 
and then this is the light source estimation procedure. Here we see the virtual glass monkey. And if I move the real light source around, we see that the real shadows and the virtual shadow and caustics are moving coherently because the light source is in detected in real time. Then we simulate that of field. So we see if camera is in focus, both real and virtual objects are sharp and otherwise they are blurred. And here we see all effects together. There is the caustic spot here. Another caustic inside is there is the refraction in the glass sphere and the reflection on the ring. And then also a depth of field if it's a bit far away. Here we can see these effects again. Uh, so here is the first image where the virtual ring and sphere are inserted. There is already reflection and refraction. But as we can see here on the borders, there is a bit noise caused by the aliasing because here we shoot just one ray per pixel. And as soon as we increase the sampling rate, we get a nicely anti-aliased image with the smooth edges here. Then we can add also caustics here, which looks more natural and also below the, below the sphere. And finally, we see here again the difference between this cube, which is a bit def defocused by the real camera, and this sphere, which is uh, very sharp. So we apply also our depth of field uh, algorithm, and we see that the, we get the defocused uh, sphere too. This is our recent result of the diffuse global illumination. So here we can see that inside of this virtual box, there is a light also in the shadows area, which is the reflected light from the lit areas. And there is also color bleedings visible here, where the this uh, orange color is coming to the white, white place. And it's also joined with the system uh, of the refraction and everything. So now everything works together. Then we did a little user study to test which effects uh, has a good impact to the perception of visual realism in the video and uh, in augmented reality. And what we did is we asked users if insertion of certain effect uh, increases or decreases the realism in the video. And we did this for these four effects, like refraction, anti aliasing caustics, and depth of field. And they could answer on the scale from minus three to three, where minus three means that the effect decreases the realism of the video, and three means that it increases it very much. So here we see the result. We see that all effects increase the realism when they are used. And probably the most important is anti aliasing, which increases the realism the most, and it creates a nicely smooth image. Because when you have uh, aliased uh, edges of the virtual objects, it's very clear that they are virtual and it's not that much natural. So what I would like to do now here uh, in HitLab is the user study, the bigger one, where I would like to observe two things. First is the perception of the presence of realistic objects in augmented reality by using our rendering system and also to detect the, the realistic appearance of the object, how realistic the users perceive them. And the second thing is to evaluate if it's possible to trick people that the virtual objects are real. So to fulfill these goals, I would like to use two scenarios. First is to use videos with real and virtual objects to, and ask users which objects are real and which are virtual to detect uh, if they can be tricked. And second scenario is to use a real-time AR setup with HMT and to detect how they perceive the visual coherence in augmented reality and the, how they perceive the presence of the virtual objects. So I would like to start the user study next week. And you are all welcome to participate. Of course, I need a lot of people. So I would be happy if you come and we agree on a date. And that's it. Thank you for your attention. Uh, yeah, what we did is we measured the frame rate, so we can already show some results of this. You mean to test it uh, by with users or? How much like it's like in one of the things we just don't move the motion is because mm -hmm. that will definitely affect the reality. That's a good question. Uh, in this user study, we don't plan to test it, but you are right. It's very important to keep it interactive, especially for applications like augmented or virtual reality. 
And that's also a big problem of the ray tracing because this is a very expensive algorithm. So we always can uh, see there the trade-off between the quality and the speed. And it would be good to observe how users perceive this. For now, we were able to achieve always uh, like interactive performance from 10 to 20 or 30 frames per second, what might be good, but it also may cause some problems. So you are right, it would be good to test it, but we will not do it this time. Yeah, yeah, I, I think, I think it, it will, but never mind. I can maybe use some differentiation between people. You should keep some of the tricks on like exposed to us, and you can see. Yeah, you already saw all the stuff, so you're right. It will affect, but I can mark who saw the video and who didn't, and then differentiate the results. You mean like you know, taking people of you don't know if they're competent future to make Oh yeah. Yeah. That would be also that would be also interesting. Virtual objects which are so realistic. Yeah. So you can actually Once I had a presentation about this depth of field effect, yeah. and there were some cubes, some of them were from papers, and some of them were virtual, and they were sometimes defocused, so uh, some people weren't able to uh, recognize which are virtual and which are real, and then they asked me because I forgot to say which are virtual and which are real, but the thing was that I didn't remember, <laughs> so <laughs> I wasn't able to say. I was gonna say related to that. Capture you know, on the internet, and you have to type in a few words to show that you're a human. You get a bunch of photos and say which one of these is real. Mm -hmm. That would be also but a good if, test. If you can't tell the difference and you've made the system, maybe it's not so good. VOF is not something that we see in our That's true, yeah. normal vision because our eyes have um, adjustable devices. Yeah, you have always focus so, on what you want to see. So, I guess what I'm thinking about is you're you're trying you're trying to you're trying to figure out if you can trick people into thinking that they're looking at something which is really which looks like an image from a camera. So you're trying to help them to figure out whether or not they're seeing something fake that contains something real. Um, is that the same as trying to figure out if the objects that they're looking at are really real? Mm, yeah, I think, yeah, you were right with the first claim that uh, we are trying to trick them, that what is on the display actually is fake because we cannot test it with the real eyes without the, any devices because we cannot create objects there somehow. We need always camera and we need always uh, display to create augmented reality. So I think what we can do now is only this one. I, I, I think I think what would be what would be interesting is how, how that's going to affect things like say your um, firefighter um, simulation mm -hmm. um, because that that's a really useful way of applying it. But um, what you're trying to do there is you're trying to simulate what they would be seeing if, they, if their normal visual system was able to penetrate, say, the smoke or the darkness or whatever they're in. Mm -hmm. um, and so we'll, what effect is simulating a camera environment going to have on how people interact with the real world? I mean, if I'm... Under normal circumstances, if I was reaching for that cup, the cup would be in focus and I'd just reach for it. If, I have, if I'm wearing something that simulates the DOF of a camera, and so my hand goes in and out of focus, depending on how far it is from, mm. from my face and so on, is that going to affect 
the way that I can interact with my sense of where things are in space and how I move around. Mm -hmm. yep. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not, I don't, I'm not saying that your, your um, user studies have to answer that question. I'm just wondering if you, if anyone has thought about that and if it's been tested in any way. Yeah, if you are asking particularly for that or field, I think this is just the one effect which doesn't have that big sense in the realism as itself because you are right that you see always sharp what you want to see. But this has a major uh, contribution for the cinematic part or, or for example movie creation part where they have a good cameras and always do that field effect. So for example if you have, want to have a system uh, which will show you the virtual objects in time of shooting the, the video so you have some actors there and you have some avatars running around and you want to see the, uh, these avatars in a real way also with depth of field of the real cameras then this might be useful and for the user study for example for the one which I do here I don't plan to test uh, depth of field for the one which we did before we did test it but you're right it doesn't make really big sense for the like a real perception of people because there is always camera and display in between. It sounds like it depends on what kind of application or yeah. um, kind of system you are using. So AR system is the mostly using camera to show the objects but that must be the same whatever which is image of what the camera is doing. So in that case um, Have something kind of retina display that actually lets you open up the virtual object and what you are actually seeing in those movies, then you have a better idea. Yeah, I agree with you. It depends on application. Sometimes it may be useful, sometimes it may be not. You know how, how expensive this ray trace, uh, sorry, uh, materializes in compared to this? Uh, when at the moment, we're using uh, for all the games, so we're using materializing. But if you have like a display, the new phone display, um, you don't need materializing anymore because you cannot see the things. When Which displays do you mean? If you know, if you have like new iPhone or new phone display, new mm -hmm. Android phone display, you can see the, the, the pixel anymore. Um, you don't need materializing anymore because that's you have the problem with the pixel. That's a good uh, question. If you don't need. I there, wouldn't be that sure. How expensive is ray tracing compared to uh, anti-aliasing? I don't know. I just don't know how expensive mm -hmm. calculation of anti-aliasing. It depends how you do anti-aliasing. Because in the games, you use usually very special tricks how to make anti-aliasing. And it doesn't uh, have any similarity with ray tracing. Because there is used rasterization. And some su super sampling of the depth values is used there. So usually, the best way to do anti-aliasing is just to use, do super sampling use more samples per pixel and then you can average the value and you have a correct value and that's exactly the same what we do in ray tracing we can just shoot more rays and get more responses and then um, then sum them together average and do anti-aliasing so if we do anti-aliasing it always makes several times more effort than just doing one ray per pixel and for for games Well, that's the, that's the problem because we can't see pixels, so you cannot see it now. Yeah, I can't see it. Yeah, even on my DVD, I just like to see what it is. It's sunny. It's sunny. It's sunny. It's sunny. It's sunny. Yeah, I agree with you. It's, I think it's always useful to have anti sync. Should we give Peter another big hand? Thanks, and now it's time for a cake. Is it real or a cheat?